doesn't all exist. We have an eye, we have a conventional eye, which is what we give, you know, the label to this body and mind. So that's, that's it, that's okay. But this, it has no function, basically. Except for when we give it too much importance and we, we, we project inherent existence into that. And this is why I started to do this meditation when we see that, you know, whenever we say I'm angry, I, I'm hurt, I hurt others and all this, that it feels different. So then we go, okay, which one is this singular I, me? And then the problem is with us Westerners, we always want to come up with an answer. But we don't. When you explore emptiness, you never ask, okay, but what is there? Because the nothing is there, right? But it's also not a complete nothingness. So you, this is why I think it. Um, this is why I think it only comes at the end, like this whole thing about emptiness. You're not really starting with emptiness. Although with our Western scientific mind, I think we would understand very quickly. At least that's what the next verse where we come to now. Such things as a continuum and an aggregation are false in the same way as a rosary and an army. There's no real owner of suffering, therefore, who has control over it? So this, they take objects as, thank you very much, they take objects in order to, um, in order to, in order to, to become more aware how things, how things appear to us and how things do not exist the way that they appear. So they talk about um, a rosary, which would be that. Yeah. So if I just ask you, what is this? Then in a very conventional way, these are bits and pieces and parts that are called rosary. If we would talk like this, we would already understand that the rosary is just the name for it. But no, we say this is a rosary. And then the mind adds inherent real existence to this. Of course, then you start to think. And you say, oh, there's individual beads, there's the thread, the beads are wood, so it comes from a tree, the tree had to be cut down and all this. We don't think like this, and it doesn't appear like this. You know, when we talk about realizing the things, it will appear like this. What appears is that as if these things have already been, always been existing, and this is wrong. And then when you try to find the rosary, if, if that rosary is really existing, now the thing is we're too clever, right? We bring in our intelligence and we go, yeah, of course it doesn't exist from its own side, I can see it, but you know, if, like with my cup now, okay? Where is my cup? If it would have been the cup from the, uh, if it wouldn't have been the cup from the box, I wouldn't have reacted like this. I would have said, where's the cup? But I said, where's my cup? Because then it becomes mine, you know, whatever, then I label mine. And then if it's not there, it seems to be a problem. And somebody has to run immediately. Somebody was kind enough to wash the cup, has to run immediately to get it. So this is my rosary, okay? so. If it's just any rosary, it doesn't really matter so much if it's not here anymore at the end of the class. If it's mine, you know, even though it's just, it's a rosary like any other rosary. It's to count the, mant the mantras that I say in the morning. But if my mind labels it mine, then to a certain degree, you know, it's not here anymore. And I see Leora is having it and playing around with it. And you know, then there is a problem. Although it is just a very normal rosary, and I have another, I have two other ones in Tel Aviv. But it becomes a problem because then the ego comes up. Oh, but I've had it for a long time. Oh, it was given to me by my teacher. Oh, it's a rosary, but the mind projects so many more things onto it. Yeah, and then attachment arises, especially if it's mine. Yeah, we can call something mine, and somebody comes and says, oh, I don't have one, can I have it? I wonder if I say yes, I'm not sure. <laughs> after, after talking to you like this, probably yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. If out of the blue somebody would have said, you know, uh, can I have, I, I need a rosary, can I have yours? 
if I would have spontaneously, of course, there's another one in the books in Tel Aviv. There's another one that I carry with me for retreats, and then I have three actually. There's another uh, kind of crystal I need for the newness. Of course, you can have it, but I'm not sure, you know, without thinking like this kind of, this is mine. Yeah. So then this I, so whose is it? Whose is it? The bodies or the minds? The ego. Huh? The ego. The merely labeled eye. Huh? As you say, the merely labeled eye. The merely labeled eye. But the merely labeled eye that needs something to be labeled on. Can the merely labeled eye own the mala? Body and mind. Body and mind are the same? No, they're different. So then I have two merely labeled eyes. One for the body, one for the mind. But which one possesses the mind? The body or the mind? Can the mind possess, does the mind need a mala? A mind cannot count, you know, I need fingers to count. You see, these are ridiculous questions. You have to really think about them without trying to find, to, to find an answer, but then to see your answer is not the right answer. You know, the moment you think you have understood, you're lost. You're blocked, you're not getting any further. And this is when they do debate, which I can't do, but you can do this game with Lamas or with Keshima. They can bring me, they can put, bring you to being crazy. You know, they only ask questions. And this is basically what Buddhism is all about. You have to find the right questions and to give you a, a very honest, spontaneous answer without thinking too much. And then we see how wrong we are instinctively. How our in instincts that we think they're great because they're instincts and they come very quick, that we think they're bringing us to the right place. And then, slowly, slowly, the transformation will happen. But one has to go through this, through the thing. So, you know, here the question is, um, army is a good one also. Football, football club is also a good one. When is a football club a, good, a football club? You know, or when is an army an army? One soldier, or let's go not into armies here. <laughs> Maybe trees and forests. When is a forest a forest? Okay, so if it, it's all, it's always about really, truly existent. Don't forget these two words. Because if our mind understands, oh, you know, it's conventionally, it depends where I stand. That conventionally, yes, it, it is a forest. But when is a forest a forest? Let's see. Uh, you say yes or no. One tree? No. Two trees? Three trees? Four? Small one. Huh? A small one. In Israel. Yeah, exactly. Small one. Yeah, so you see, so Neil would say small one, others would say no. Okay, so this is it. When is it a real forest? When people agree on it, or when you agree on it. Or you see, you know, in order for something to exist, it has to have a basis, which is the parts, then it has to have a function, of course. And then it has to need a mind that puts the label. Yeah. So, with the function, okay, if you see something that is made out of metal, which has four tires, but is totally rusty and one door is broken, <laughs> uh, you see what I'm trying to get at? Somewhere in the field lying or in the forest lying, what would you say? Which idiot? put this car there. We would call even this a car. If we go and buy a car and somebody presents us with a car like this, we go, this is not a car, what are you trying to tell me? So this is how things come into existence by having a basis, having a name and the mind who puts the label or puts the name. But we mistake them for really tr being truly, really existent. And then, you know, we don't see impermanence, we, we create attachment and all this, yeah. But also when we say, we have to be careful because when we say ego, I know that very often in Buddhism one uses ego, but it's because we also say my ego, or whose ego? Yeah, whose ego? 
Whose ego? I will say why I said ego. I try to explain it because... Yeah, everybody says I, ego. Don't worry. When I'm in a survival mode, yeah. when I feel some kind of threat, the eye becomes really clear. Uh. And I think this is why it's easy to get confused and uh -huh. to leave the eye. Because yeah. most of the time, I'm in survival mode. Uh-huh. <laughs> for you. That's not good for your system. You have to talk to your ego and say, look, we want to have harmony here, we want to be well, all of us together, body, mind, ego, self, whatever. So please calm down because you are putting out all these chemicals into my brain that makes me in a survival mode. But then again, you know, when we look at neuroscience, it's just chemicals. Do we go, oh, my chemicals are going crazy? <laughs> no, that would be realistic, isn't it? You know, the, ne the neurons are latching all to things that they make kind of connections with things that are not supposed to, what they call called, synapses, 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 something like this, you know, that it would be so helpful to work with our emotions when we start talking like this or thinking like this, because then we see, it. this is not me, you know, this is, we don't identify with it, yeah? But it's, it's interesting, it's not just you, Sigal, it's everybody who says ego, but it's not really the ego, it's a kind of, that one is not, that one tries to put aside, it's really a, an exaggerated view of an I, of a me, that, that one adds inherent real existence as the possessor of the body and the mind. Because I say, my body and my mind, and that sounds as if the I is the boss. And the I is possessing the body and the mind. But if I take away the body, and if I take away the mind, what remains? Nothing. We should say the I, but that doesn't make sense. You know, if I'm the possessor of this mala, I can throw, and the mala has of course, there's no mana or the beads, the parts. So it's kind of, if I throw this away, I'm still existing. But if I take away the body and the mind, what is still there? And instinctively, I, me. Not even kind of going into, a, but how, excuse me. But instinctively is I, or I use, that also, maybe for you is helpful, maybe not. I use the same example usually. If somebody comes and says, I can give you a better body, like, you know, young, fit, and not so much fat here, and all these kind of things. Wrinkles, I don't care, they don't hurt, and they're not in the way anyway, you know. Wrinkles, I don't, is fine. Uh, so, of course, I say yes. And uh, if then somebody comes and says, I can give you a better mind, more compassionate, less confused, blah, blah, of course I say yes. <laughs> then I have a feeling as if there's an I here who is getting a new body and a new mind. So where does this I go in the meantime, uh, when the exchange is happening? What is left for my little son then? <laughs> This is it, you see? So this is how we feel, as if the I is the possessor of body and mind. My body, my mind. And that is, logically speaking, not possible. Even though it feels like this. At one point also we were going at Tushita after the, you know, course, we were going through, you, you know, you examine your body, you examine your mind, you say, which is the I, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. There's one woman who refused to leave the gompa. She was so angry. And she said, I couldn't find it anywhere, but I know it exists. And I said, you found it, that's it, that's the one. You know, logically we understand it doesn't exist, but instinctively we're still grasping onto it. Do you understand a little bit better maybe what is being refuted? What is being refuted here in the army and the mala a really existing mala who can exist as a mala, separate from minds. Everything is mind-touched. Everything that appears to us is not as it is out there. It appears to me according to my karma, my sense, my senses. If I would be a bee, you know, these beautiful flowers out here, I would perceive them differently. 
I would see them as food. If I'm allergic to anything like this, I would see it as danger. If I'm neither a bee nor allergic, I think, oh wow, very nice flowers. And also because it's fresh flowers, I suppose. Not sure, but I suppose. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> also because it's fresh, very beautiful flowers, I understand they're impermanent. So if it's very hot in here, and in the evening they go like this, no big deal, because I know that they are impermanent, right? But we project permanence in things that don't show us impermanence quickly enough. Nobody would be depressed when these flowers in the evening are already, except for, you know, in Switzerland you buy cut flowers, which usually I don't buy because I think it's like they come from Africa somewhere and it's totally crazy. But now they put the thing guaranteed to keep for five days. And sometimes they don't. Yeah. Then maybe you get attached because then you get angry because you bought them and you paid a lot of money for something that after four or five days is, is totally gone, which has to be flown in from who knows where. And I'm oh, sorry, Inval is not here, right? She's in the flower business. <laughs> They're shipping flowers all over Europe. Um, so, so anyway, but with flowers we understand. We enjoy them as when they're there, when it's finished, it's finished, that's it. So when we understand there's not this sadness and uh, you know all this, I mean, come on, I, to I, I told you I met this elderly couple um, on the train from, and we were talking about life and death and this and that, and he said, he said, well, but death is such a, such a natural part of our life, but we just don't understand. This is why we make such a big deal out of it. And if, you know, you're, if I tell somebody uh, who has just a uh, mother or father who died, and I say, well, what do you want? I mean, they're old, it's, uh, it's normal. You would be heartless to say things like that. You're heartless to tell somebody the truth. Although Israelis are very much attached to truth. They always want to know the truth. You tell them, then they're not happy. So it's like they want to know their truth. Also about truth is really amazing because kind of, you know, what make amazing or good. In the truth that we can understand through our senses and intellectually is not true. It's not really true, it's just conventionally true, relatively true. And we make such a big fuss about I'm right and you are wrong. I mean, the elections now, okay? So it's like you want to convince somebody else to vote for somebody else. They want to convince you to vote for somebody else. Both of you are sure that I'm not going to be convinced. What's the point of discussing? Just leave Tell each me. other alone and say what you want and do and, and then go and vote. And that's it. So, okay, so this is the thing, the whole thing about emptiness. And this is why we're having problems. And this is why there's attachment and anger. And now we come maybe slowly to the point where it says kind of, we have two enemies. This is on camera, so I can't say. I almost said that. You know, people who are here, I almost said Ben Ria and yeah, the other one. So anyway, well, I can't say that, but I just say it. So maybe, maybe they won't let me into the country. No, or like you know, your mother, your, your mother-in-law, or and your boss, or something like that. So we have two enemies. What are they? This, the other, this political thing and the mother-in-law, that was a joke. Yeah, you have to be quite sharp when I teach. You have to be able to distinguish when I'm just making a joke. <laughs> and, uh, when it's serious, what I'm saying is dangerous. So. Yeah, this is why I want to stop teaching, because I want, don't want to tease people like this anymore. Okay, so we have two enemies. What are they? Self-grasping ignorance and self-centered attitude? Yes. That's the only enemies we have. Believing in a truly existing I, self, or me. That's the first one. Because of that, we cherish it. Yeah, like we grasp at it, that goes with the first one. We, we believe in it, we grasp at it, we hold it for true, and then we start to cherish it. So with these two kinds of bodhicitta, 
you start to chip away on their power over us. With ultimate bodhicitta, thinking about emptiness again and again and again and again, you loosen the belief in an eye. At least you start to wonder, oh, I was so sure. You know, Ariella, when you said we have this bottle and you showed me the bottle and said, but the bottle is here. So we start to loosen up a little bit that view. You know, you know you, when you do these analyses, you stop wanting to prove to you that the bottle is really here. You have to find it to show that is really here. But we go, I can touch it. But who touches? <coughs> if your nervous system is kaput, what are you going to touch here? Nothing. You know, that people, when we are numb sometimes, you try to touch something. So what is it? Is it the body or is it the mind who doesn't perceive anymore? It's like you ask yourself all these questions. With, you just start to be open to ask questions that you've never asked yourself. And you're not giving yourself the answer because otherwise, again, you're blocked. Yeah? So we start to doubt that this I who is now so depressed and so unhappy and so feeling guilty. Oh, yeah. We talked with this couple, we talked about the guilt in this country. I mean, it's like, it's amazing how many people feel guilty, you know? Um, so just another, another kind of play of this inflated eye. So you start to really think, maybe it doesn't exist the way that it manifests. You know, Lama Zopra but in one point also, he was asking the student a lot of questions, is this, 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 and the student went really, <laughs> And then Rinpoche said, but I didn't ask you for, him, for that you show me what it is. I'm just asking you if it's that. Why do you want to find an answer? And that's very strange for us, that there could be a question that is very valid and very beneficial without finding an answer. This for us is new concept. It's totally new concept. So with ultimate bodhicitta, thinking about emptiness, you know, again, these four analyses, the four, four point analysis, it is so helpful. And you're left with, ah, like this, and that's good. Like if something exists, you're, it has to be findable. I mean, come on, yes, no, yes. Where can it be found? Oneness with the parts, or separate from the parts. Now again, let's take this. Is the rosary that really exists, is it oneness with its parts? The, it, you can say yes, but that's not enough. You have to give me a, how to say, an argument for yes, it's oneness with the parts. A consequence of this. If it's oneness with the parts, what does it mean? That, for example? You have a lot of them. In one beat, I should be able to see the rosary. Or there's a little bit of rosary in each bead. I mean, it's stupid. You're not, you know, when you have to find, buy new beads, you're not going, I want, I want the part of my rosary. You say, I want, I want, to, I want the bead, right? Okay? So we can see it's neither in the thread nor in the, in the beads. There's nothing else here, only thread and beads. So it's not oneness with its part. Or it's same cake. If you have a cake out of, oh sorry, vegan cake, okay? Mm -hmm. Flour, margarine, maybe oil, um, what yes. else? Go sugar? Yes. Rhubarb. Rhubarb. <laughs> <laughs> sugar, <laughs> rhubarb, whatever. You know, uh, so it's what? When it's together, it's a rhubarb cake. Really existing rhubarb cake. So if the cake that we, wow, you know, attachment, oh, it smells so good. If it would be oneness with its part, so there would be a little bit of cake already in, I was just about to say, in the egg, in the, in the hen, but since there's no eggs, there would have been a little bit of rhubarb cake already in the olive, where the oil comes from. It's ridiculous, yeah? If it's oneness with its parts. Or did the cake only come in once you press the olive? Uh, no, yeah, it's not in the flour. Definitely not. It's not in the rhubarb. I don't see cake when I see rhubarb. Yeah? Okay. So it's not oneness with its parts. Is it separate from the parts? Meaning, I can have all the parts of the rosary here, 
and the rosary on this side. That's also ridiculous. Is there any other way that it could exist? No. Conclusion? The conclusion? The objectivity of the object is the emptiness of the object. Exactly. It does not exist objectively out there from its own side. Try not to understand Ariella. <laughs> Relax. You don't need to find an answer. This is so important. I think the word oneness, yeah. its part, yeah. that's what's confusing me. Okay, what is because, confusing? Because oneness, for me, oneness with the parts, it's being a part of the part, meaning the rosary, the beads, the thread, the trees, the cotton that the thread is made of. It's all oneness to but become how can a it rosary. Be? Yeah, okay, but how can it be logically? It's all different things. But then if you separate them, this is a bead, this, okay. is, this is a thread, okay. and it's not a rosary. And when it comes together, it's a rosary. It's a rosary. Again, this argument. It's like saying <clears throat> one apple, which is not an orange, if I put ten of them together which are not orange, it becomes an orange? How can something that is not that, when you put it together, become something that it is not at no point? It feels like this, you're right, so let go of that, try to, let, try to loosen up that grasping, kind of, but you know, it's all the parts together, because that's what it looks like. But then it needs to be a bit of rosariness kind of in these parts. That means oneness. Oneness means already when it's separate, it's already there. Because when does the oneness come in? At what point? I talked about the body. I said, when is a body a body? What if one finger is missing? Is it still a body? Yes. So again, it's the same with the forest. You know, some say yes. What if one arm is missing? Is it still a body? What if one both arms are missing? What if arms and legs are missing? What if, you know... So when does a body become a body? Again, you don't have a clear answer to that. So this is, it, you, you're kind of, you're almost there if you see this as this oneness thing as an illusion that when it comes together, it's one. It's not. This is, this is the illusion. Oneness with its part means you have to be able to find it when the parts are apart. That means one, oneness. That a little bit of the cake has to be in the olive oil, or the flour, or the sugar. And it's not, nowhere. That's what means oneness with its parts. And also if, you know, we have a body and a mind, so we need <laughs> two eyes. One for the body, one for the mind. But we have one, and we say, I'm hungry, that's the body. We say, I'm happy, that's the mind. So which is the real one? None of them. As Ketchi Sherab says, neither. You know, when instead of, we, our mind goes both, right? So, like when I go <laughs> here, for me is here, for you is there, is that, where I point my finger, here or there. So, very often, the first thing is, it's both. But it cannot be both because it's different. How can something be one when it's different? Logically, you have to use logic here. It's impossible to be one when it's different. Okay? But it, it's neither, but relatively speaking, it's either here or there. And when we start to understand, we start to see that my opinion is not the same as yours, but it's not mine is right and yours is wrong, what we're totally convinced about, but it's just different. And we can still see the sameness in people that we all want to be happy and nobody wants to suffer. That's when we understand emptiness. So with ultimate reality, thinking about emptiness to kind of weaken our grasping at a really existing self, right? And with conventional bodhicitta, which is the six perfections, 
and you know, letting others go first and developing bodhicitta, we chip away the self-cherishing that others come first. And this is what we're doing at the moment. This verse very much goes into ultimate bodhicitta. Yeah, there is no real owner of suffering, therefore who 